the children have to say. Special word of thanks, of course, to the children's teacher, Miss Stacy, and all the other teachers who've been involved in this. It's, um, it's a strenuous, stressful time for all concerned. But now, the stress is over, the work is done, and we can enjoy the fruits. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, boys and girls, for coming along to the PYP8 <laughs> exhibition. Perspectives on bluefin tail population. Changing. 
different tuna populations in the world. Uh, these are three types of bluefin tuna which are endangered. The first one is the southern bluefin tuna. The second one is the Atlantic bluefin tuna. And the third one is the Pacific bluefin tuna. Uh, this picture shows the bluefin tuna being caught. And in Japan, this the one of the biggest bluefin tuna, well, one of the biggest fishing markets there. The biggest bluefin tuna ever sold there was 500,000 US dollars. Uh, what other things are causing tuna populations to change? Uh, pollution is one of the main causes um, of decreasing tuna populations. Others. Other things like garbage, oil spills, and sewage are all facts according to National Geographic. My solution to it is that we all, all the countries in the world have to come together and uh, clean up the ocean, especially the fishermen could stop uh, fishing so the um, fish have time to repopulate. This graph shows that since 1970 to 2005 that the amount of bluefin tuna in the world has plummeted and it's still plummeting today. Different perspectives on overfishing. There are two different perspectives on overfishing. The first is the fishermen. The fishermen want to fish as much as they can until there's no fish left in the ocean. When the marine biologists want to save as much fish as they can with quotas and marine reserves. Responsibilities to me. In my research, I've discovered that there are three different type main reasons why tuna populations are dropping. The first one is they're being completely overfished. The second is that we're not being sustainable with the food we use. In around China, and the third is that we don't have enough quotas in the ocean. How we can help overfishing? There's something called the safety net. The safety net is a net with reinforced steel holes, so when the net being stretched, fish can escape. And they have lights and flashing LEDs, so they act like beacons for the fish to escape out of, even when the net's being stretched. And since the net is dragged one meter above the seabed, it doesn't destroy all the coral reefs. How we can help being sustainable? We can help by buying from sustainable resources such as Co-op tuna and Sainsbury tuna, also by buying more sustainable fish to cook with like salmon. Are humans impacting on bluefin tuna populations? Humans are impacting because of pollution and overfishing. Well, when human, when we pollute, it goes to the ocean and it affects different sea life. And with overfishing, we are catching too much at one point, which doesn't give the whichever fish we're catching a chance. Fishing, how can help bluefin tuna? We need quotas in the ocean because fishermen are catching as much as they can. If we were to limit the amount of fish they can catch, we could possibly give the uh, bluefin tuna time to regenerate their populations. Uh, here's a video.
complex. Well, um, it may not be from the local perspective in that local boats won't catch a wide volume of fish. However, there are a number of boats from other countries who are based out of Trinidad who can go further up to the local boats there in Barbados who tend to catch up more fish and sail a little longer. And if they, they may be from our perspective, taking catching a lot more fish.
I found a very interesting fact that the hawksbill toes in Indonesia eat the normal diet, while the hawksbill toes in the Caribbean eat just sea sponges. With the reproduction of the hawksbill turtle. Hawksbill turtles mate round about when they're 25 years old, which is when they're sub adults. Mating season is usually April to November. Mating is usually done in shallow waters. No information is available that they have lifelong partners. After mating, then they, the female lays the eggs. They could be 100 to 180 eggs. After she lays her eggs, she goes back to the sea. Then two months later, the hatchlings hatch. What are the weights and predators of the different ages? When hatchlings are born, they weigh 0.5 ounces. When they are one years old, they weigh 35 ounces. When they are post-hatchlings, they weigh 1,000 grams. All these different ages have the same predators. The birds and predatory fish. The most common birds that usually feed on these kind of hawksbill turtles are seagulls. And here's a very sad fact about hatchlings. Only one out of 5,000 make it to adulthood. What are the reasons for the hawksbill turtle to be hunted? The hawksbill turtle used to be hunted for its shell, meat, and eggs. The, the eggs and meat were usually eaten, and the shell was made into jewelry. Now it is illegal, but people still do it. And in the black market, the one kilogram of meat is worth two hundred and fifty dollars. What are the populations of the hawksbill turtle over the years? Panama used to support the largest population population of nesting females in the Caribbean with 534 to 891 nesting females. Now Cuba had the largest population in the Caribbean with 534 to 891 nesting females. There are four regional places around the globe that have more than a thousand hawksbill turtles. There's three places on, in Australia, one in Indonesia. What are the human impacts that affect the hawksbill turtle? As you can see here, I have two main points, but there are many others. But I'm going to talk about one that is very useful to hawksbill turtles. Oil spills are one of the most dangerous impacts that can happen to a hawksbill turtle. What happens is that the oil goes into their lungs and then they suffocate. What do people do to help the hawksbill turtle? I, I myself went to a turtle hospital and this is what they told me. They, what happens if a turtle has a, an infection, they usually give them antibiotics or if they have, if they eat rubbish, they give them an operation. Then after when they are better, the people put them in a large pool with other turtles. It takes a hundred days before releasing them, but another thing that can also happen if the injury is very severe, they can become permanent residents and never go into the wild again. What can you do to help the hospital turtle? You can buy, you can help by using mass receptacles for debris, cigarette filters, plastic bags, or monofilament and material that can make any material that can make its way into the ocean. Another way if you can help, if you see a nesting female, do not disrupt her with quick movements or flashlights, as this may disrupt her nesting. What is my conclusion? I think that people are doing a very good job helping the whole school turtle, but I also think we have to aware more people and educate them so they can help, and so the whole school turtle can increase its population. Because over 10 years of protection, 80% has gone down. What, what are the limit profiles that did I show? I was a thinker because I thought about my problem and tried to figure it out, even if it was difficult. I was principled because even when I was doing something wrong and I had to start all over again, I did not get frustrated. I was reflective 
Because before I did something, I would question myself on the idea if it was good or not. Where did I get my information from? As you can see, I have a lot of resources. But my two main ones were Dr. Jackie Bruce at the Turtle Hospital in Florida Keys and Dr. Spieler and Mr. Spieler. And here's where I got my pictures. Um, my action is I went to the Turner Hospital in Florida Keys. I learned lots of interesting things. And I decided to give money because when I saw the turtles, they really needed help. And after that experience, I decided to help them more by wearing people so they can also help. Here's some videos that my dad filmed at the floor of the keys. Um, as you can see here, this turtle by the, the, the boy. Her name was April and she got hit by a spear and one of her eyes are blind and 95% of her other eye is blind also so she, she's a permanent resident because she can't bend herself and predators could eat her. These are some pictures that my dad took at the Turner Hospital in the Florida Keys. And here's a video on the Hawksmoor Turner in Barbados. I'm going to show it when we're doing um, the exhibition with the slides. Sea, sea 
sea life of the coral habitats will also die because they depend on each other. What is the government's responsibility for cleaning up the oil spill in the ocean? The BP company was responsible for the Gulf of oil spill. When the oil is cleaned up, the BP company had to pay a lot of money to clean up the oil from the ocean, but a lot of companies were also involved to clean up the oil spill, as well as the government of the Gulf of Mexico. It was everyone's responsibility who lives in the Gulf to clean up the oil spill because they cannot use the water for activities and they depend on it for food and jobs. The lunar profile that Brianna displayed for this exhibition was, she was a thinker because she made ideas for her display and her experiment. She was a communicator by telling her mentor what she wanted to do and listening to her mentor's ideas as well. She was also knowledgeable for when she researched about her topic and found a lot of information about it. Thank you for watching Brianna's presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.
they feed by, like I said, doing the bubble trail, but they sometimes get water, so they have to let it out somehow so they blow. Breeding. Head, head slap is used for breeding. Head slap is produced by males to trap females. The jaw clap. Jaw clap is when the whale open and closes his mouth. And his jaws clap. And then um, with the dog, the jaws clap in order to yeah, so trap females' attention. Tail extension. The whale slowly raises its tail onto the air, sometimes high enough that generally that they clear the, the surface. The petrol slap. The whale rolls its petrol fins, slapping them against the water. Migration. Spy hopping. Spy hopping is used by both male and female whales to look around them to see if they can see boats or icebergs anywhere around like them. Breaching. Whale breaching is when the whale leaps out of the water, generally clearing the surface with two thirds of its body or more, often with a twisting motion. Fluke dive. Fluke dive signals a deep dive following the pectoral arch. The humpback will usually bring its float high above the surface of the water onto its way to, onto its way to the bottom. Uh, uh, this is the learner profile that I feel I have most demonstrated. Gavin, I feel I have most demonstrated communicator a lot to me and my partner do not argue a lot in the exhibition. <laughs> okay, care. I understand the need to take action to take care of our, of our oceans. We'll, we'll show the video when we're doing the museum walkthrough. If you want to see it, you can come. Here's our references where we got our pictures and information from. Uh, thanks for watching our presentation. How do natural reefs form compared to artificial reefs? 
Naturally, it's formed by a floating algae in the water that attaches itself to a rock or any hard structure sustainable for life. Then corals begin to grow, and small fish come to eat the corals, and then the bigger fish come to eat the smaller fish. Art oh, and then the food chain begins. Artificial reefs form basically the same way, it's just a lot faster, because it, they're pre-made and it can take only about a month, where naturally can form up to 500 years. My question is, how do artificial reefs change the ocean? The answer that I got was, artificial reefs are mainly good for the ocean, but do have some bad effects, like when you place it into the ocean, it can damage or harm um, natural reefs, but the good effects are that they can provide homes, protection, and food for the marine life. Um, the reflection for our research shows that artificial reefs are working for what people want them to, and they are helping the ocean in various ways. Artificial reefs help repopulate marine and other organisms. The process. First, we had to think about what our topic could be and what we would do, and we decided to do artificial reefs. You can kind of talk. Um, <laughs> then we had to come up with our big question, and after we wrote our lines of inquiry, we had to assign each group member to a question. After we did that, we, we started our research and came up with all of our answers. And then after all that, we are now here doing our presentation. Um, pictures. Um, we actually took these pictures when we went to Carlisle Bay. We went snorkeling with my mom and we found a telephone, one of those old telephones from one of the shipwrecks. We saw three shipwrecks and they were sunk in different points of time and we could tell that because some were developed and some were still developing and some had a lot of fish and some didn't. Um, what was really interesting was when we were swimming over one, we, um, something caught our eye and we thought it was a turtle, we thought it was alive but it turned out it was dead. Um, yeah. <laughs> we found an anchor, which I think was a really good picture that is built up. And, um, yeah. <laughs> we decided to take a lot of group photos, and there's that one in the corner. We found a turtle. Which was the live this time. I was swimming by and quickly took a picture of it. Yeah, group of us. These are the learner profile that we demonstrated. We showed it in the chat. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
80% of the garbage is from land and 20% of the garbage is from boats. It holds glass, rubber, metal, and many other materials. A lot of this garbage is non recyclable. What causes trash in the Pacific? Rotating currents in the Pacific make it stay as a garbage patch by spiraling in a clockwise direction. If these currents were not spiraling round and round, the garbage would have drifted away a long time ago into other seas, other countries, and so on. Trash can get to the sea by overflowing storm drains, sewage pipes, high winds, and storms that can blow the trash from off the shore to the sea. Fertilizer runoff from farms and lawns are also a huge problem for coastal areas. Is it possible to clean it all up? The answer is no. It is mostly impossible to clean up on a large scale because of all the dumping mankind has done over the years. Even if we could, there would still be microscopic pellets of plastic and other trash in the ocean. Also, wreckage from Japan tsunami is going across the Pacific and will most likely end up on North American shore. How is trash effect changing the sea life of the ocean? One example of trash affecting sea animals is turtles, and the population is changing. They mistake plastic bags for jellyfish, their food today to can die. If you see a turtle, you can call that number, and someone will make sure the turtles get safely to sea. One reason marine life is in danger is because of harmful chemicals. One problem is lead. Lead damages the brain, kidneys, and reproductive system. Lead can be found in paint and other chemicals. Cars also pollute the ocean. In fact, they are very harmful. Sometimes when you see fumes come out the back of a car, it ends up becoming acid rain. Acid rain is when pollutant is mixed with regular rain, so when it rains, the pollutants in the rain can pollute the fish. Many fishermen are finding fish with pieces of plastic inside them. Fish eat the plastic which remains in its stomach. The fish think it's full and doesn't sleep, and so they stop that. In addition to all polluting fish, it also destroys the water proofing on feathers and the seabirds. So this means that animals will drown and die. How is trash changing coral reefs? The coral reefs are changing immensely. In fact, in the last decade, 35 million acres of coral reefs have been lost, and 70% may be lost in your lifetime. Fertilizers run off into the ocean and make the water look cloudy. As a result, the coral can't get enough light and find itself smothered. We are given the coral a deadly diseases from our human race. The disease is called white box and gives the coral white looking blobs. The coral will have the disease for a few years and then die. There is no cure at the moment, but scientists are constantly trying to find one. How is it our responsibility towards trash in the ocean? When people drop glass bottles in the sea, it may end up on the coral. Coral needs some light to survive, and if something's blocking it, the coral will die. Humans are responsible for the trash in the garbage patch. It would be impossible to clean up each piece of garbage. We also have responsibilities to share our worlds with marine life. The boardwalk in Barbados is made to protect the South Coast beaches. Barbados needs to get responsible and create a new law for dumping in the sea because there isn't one yet. Lani Edgeville grew up in Barbados and when she was a child, she did beach cleanups. She now works at the Future Center for us. People should do what Maddie does, because then our oceans wouldn't be so polluted. Human Barbados, everyone is responsible for cleaning the beaches. What is the function of coral Many fish rely on reefs for their food and shelter. If there were no reefs, the small fish would die because their food, they would have even more reefs. Ultimately, the big fish would die because their food, the small fish would be gone. Barbados main income of tourism. This is because of our beautiful reefs and beaches. If there were no reefs, Barbados would have less money coming in. We can also get medicine from coral reefs. Some of the medicine is used for cancer treatment. So if there were no coral reefs, there would be not as many ways to cure cancer. Coral reefs control the carbon dioxide in the water. If corals did not exist, the level of carbon dioxide in the water would be dangerous and affecting life on Earth. They are a valuable source of life, so they help to protect us against hurricanes and bad weather. Coral reefs can also slow down water before it reaches shore. 
Pictures of trash effects and colors. Shawan is a deadly disease named White Hawk. And here in the corner, you can see a plastic bag is blocking the sunlight from getting to her. So it won't work. This bottle is blocking the sunlight from getting to her. Pictures of trash that can see that. Here in these pictures, you can see a lot of the animals have nets around them. One of the reasons for this is because sometimes fishermen lose their nets at sea. Animals also eat lots of plastic, which can choke them when they will die. Not only is it sea life in the water, but birds can ingest the garbage too. Our action plan. Um. On the 30th of March, we went to 10 days to do a beach cleanup. Here's a video of what we did.
many ways in which we can help stop trash in the ocean. Do a beach cleanup. Contact Future Centre Trust to find out more. Try to avoid using cling film. Use pl plastic containers instead. Reuse plastic bottles or buy a reusable metal one. Use plastic bag more than once or use a canvas bag which can be used many times. The learn profile which we demonstrated during the exhibition. I think I have demonstrated caring, knowledgeable, and principled. I think I, I think I'm an Inca, caring, communicator, risk taker, principal, and knowledgeable. I'm open minded, a thinker, caring, communicator, knowledgeable, and principled.
third point will be low nine fishing. Low niners normally catch hammerhead sharks. These low nines when seven to string needs wire. People in long nine countries even know it's illegal. My, luck, my final point will be shark nets. They catch non target sharks and other marine wildlife. Mostly, sharks get caught in nets intended for other species, even endangered and protected species. Question number two. What is the best form of help that we can give sharks in order to survive? I asked this question to Ryan Johnson, a marine biologist who specializes in saving sharks. Ryan is based in South Africa and involved in lots of TV shows for National Geographic, including the program Shark Hunt. Ryan said, we have to get children passionate about sharks the same way that children are passionate about saving whales. This will influence the parents and then influence the legislators. Ryan also said, we have to promote shark ecotourism as a revenue raiser. If local communities can financially benefit from using shark as a tourism object, then they will be motivated to fight against the long lines. They get more well to have the shark alive than dead. Some countries are already doing this, like in the Bahamas and the Maldives. Another way would be to stop people in Asia in a traditional shark fin soup. People in Asia need to be educated and informed about the incredible damage that their eating habits cause them. It is also important to recognize that it is impossible for an Asian person, for a Western person to educate an Asian person due to cultural reasons. We need an influential Asian person to take this message to Asia, Asia and then make the results. Another point would be to make government agree to ban shark and soup. If we can prove to the government that a shark is worth more alive than dead, then catching sharks will become a myth. We also need scientists to get more accurate information about whether shark populations are increasing <coughs> or declining, and also how to conserve sharks sustainably. What is Hugh's perspective towards saving the ocean sharks? My first one is ignorance. Lots of people have no idea how important, how important shark parts are in the ecosystem. All they know is that they will be safer in the ocean without sharks. My second one will be greed. People see sharks in terms of how much money they can make from their pins. They forget all about the marine ecosystem and how important sharks are to it, and they continue killing. People don't want to save sharks because they are terrified of them. They imagine a scary little great white shark, which they think is going to kill them if they're swimming or surfing. The fact that you are 30 times more likely to be shot by lightning or killed by a bee doesn't change the fact that, the, that they are more scared of getting killed by a shark. When people think about sharks, they don't really get past the teeth. So as parents get furry, so people are naturally drawn to try to save them. Sharks are the exact opposite. When people see one, they just want to kill it. Most people are unaware that millions of sharks are killed every year because sharks don't often appear on their endangered list. When people get super scared of something, it is called phobia. An irrational fear of sharks is called selectophobia. I decided to see what people in Barbados thought about saving sharks by interviewing a film with half a dozen people to get their perspective. Here is a video. <laughs> Thank you. 